Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm so thrilled that you're all able to be here with us this afternoon. My name is Jean Bean, and I'm the coordinator for the RIT ASL Deaf Studies Community Center. I'm thrilled to present today a very special lecturer, two of them, in fact, the two co-authors of a newly published book. And we will have a book signing at the table in the rear following the presentation. The authors are Dr. Ted Supala and Patricia Clark. Ted Supala has been, his home has been here in Rochester for a very long time, for 25 years in fact. He's worked at the University of Rochester researching and um, as the director of the American Sign Language Program. He's recently moved to Georgetown University and he's currently doing research there. He graduated from the University of California at San Diego with both his MA and his PhD degree from that university in the field of psychology. He's been involved in sign language research in many forms, researching ASL, researching the psycholinguistic aspects of sign language processing, and he's worked with many people, with among them Peter Hauser and Dee Dee Schlehofer. He himself is deaf from a deaf family. And Patricia Clark is also from a deaf family, and she herself is hearing a coda. And the name of the book that they've co-authored is Sign Language Archaeology, <laughs> Uncovering the Roots of American Sign Language, Uncovering Where Our Signs Have Descended From. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome Dr. Sapala. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. I'm very happy to be here to see old friends and faces and new faces as well. I hope to meet some of you afterwards. The purpose today is for our presentation. Well, we presented on Monday at the University of Rochester to announce our book and to express our appreciation for them supporting our long-term research that Patty and I have done. It's not, it, it's not been a very easy road. Some information from Monday's presentation I will still include in today's, but I've also inserted additional information for you to help describe and, and develop a confidence in understanding the history of ASL. I want to make sure that this is a more in-depth presentation so that you are happy with the presentation, but we also did the same thing. It took us many, many years to research, to rewrite. It's been a long journey, <laughs> and it's not a teeny tiny rowboat that took us on this journey. It was a large ship because we had many people contribute to this work. We actually do have our roots in France historically and what we've uncovered is that there is a clear French sign language connection. At, at the same time, modern French sign language has almost no resemblance to American Sign Language, but we, that contributed to our work so that we could trace the divergence of French Sign Language from, or, or American Sign Language from French Sign Language. The term archeology span was not a physical dig for us, but of course it does represent, just, like, just as you get dirty doing physical archeological work, you get dirty as well in trying to uncover and dig out the history of American Sign Language. 
It requires extensive investigation and searching for resources and sources, just as a, an archaeologist might look for the appropriate place to dig out historical background. This search helped us to identify where to look in history. We found times in our history where there was <coughs> plenty of information available. But then there were periods of time where there was almost no information to be uncovered. We all are familiar with De La Paix in 1760 during the uh, American Revolution, essentially, you see the establishment of the French school where you know the story with De La Paix discovering those two deaf um, young women, sisters, who, uh, pr who actually uh, encouraged him to think of, the, of how to educate them. And of course, he has been recognized by the generations we also know Laurent Clare. We're familiar with the fact that Thomas Hopkins, T.H. Gallaudet, took a ship to England and then met Clare and he studied in France. You all know the story. And it ended up bringing Laurent Clare to the United States as the only deaf representative of French Sign Language. Apparently, he was the person to disseminate the language if you will. Many people have doubted whether that was indeed the case, that only one person could help develop the language, but we'll talk about that later. So you have a history, a relationship between French Sign Language, or LSF, and ASL. This is a good basic frame for trying to determine how the histories interrelate, but also how the history actually continues through time. You notice that there are dotted lines up here on this slide because there are tiny gaps in its history. Today, for example, no one talks about this dark spot on the video, I mean on the uh, slide. Many people are unaware of the fact that there were films produced during that period, and so Patty and I have referred to it as the dark period. with the term dark period, you assume that there was something else that existed prior to that period before it went dark. And we will talk about what we found before it and, and how what happened prior to the dark period collapsed at the onset of the dark period. What were the forces that contributed to its collapse and to the um, the beginning of the dark period, many of us think that, oh, well, it's very easy to just look it up in the history books, but that is not the case. Extensive archaeological research was done in order to uh, fill in that dark period and, and identify the records that help us to enlighten that period, if you will. As you know, Many of you are familiar with the Vedits film, the George Vedits film, but encountering people and talking to them about this series of films, no one knows of other uh, signers on the films. <laughs> They're very familiar with Vedits. So how we talk about what happened during that period and how we um, look at signers and what they did during the production of these films was of interest to us to help us uncover and enlighten that dark period. Now there's a, you know, there are many books that are published entitled Who's Who in America or Who's Who of whatever. So we decided to investigate the who's who of the Gallaudet lecture films, which is what was this film series was titled, produced by the National Association of the Deaf. They formed a committee and determined who to select to record for posterity. There were many factors that they took into consideration 
in selecting these signers that they were going to put on film and the qualifications, the, the requirements for selecting these people. We, of course, had to do archaeological digging to identify the characteristics of these signers and identify the reasons for selecting these signers. Those that are uh, up in the upper left corner, they were presidents of the NAD and they were also represented in the film, the ones that are circled. They were professors as well at Gallaudet College. You know that Gallaudet College <coughs> has uh, more than 150 year uh, history. And back in 1860 and 1870, these faculty members were very young. Now, there are others, though, that are represented on these films that actually were very, very, that were at maybe seven or eight years old when, when these faculty members started teaching at Gallaudet College. And we have representation of that younger generation also on the film. All of these circles represent signers that were recorded on film eventually. These films were produced between 1910 and 1920 because the NAD had a plan. They did extensive fundraising. The committee made tremendous project, uh, progress and filmed signers for a period of 10 years, carefully recording and identifying who was going to be filmed and what they were going to talk about. This careful planning of who was being signed on the films was not based on the general membership of the NAD voting on who they liked to the best. Instead, it was based on the committee's choices. In researching the proceedings of the NAD conventions, I wanted to capture what the rationale was much of it was political, and I wanted to identify whether there were good stories, if you will, uh, behind the selection of these individuals. As a result, we have a collected literary history <coughs> behind each of those signers. There was one time when the NAD did vote on uh, selecting an individual, and that was the very last one. Vedets, he's, uh, he's, his picture is, is shown here. And then if you look at the person under him, has a hat, that person is Marshall. His nephew, actually there were two brothers by the name of Marshall, and it was a very, um, very strong generational deaf family. You have, uh, as many of you have met the younger Marshall who is now gone, but the older Marshall was the one that was recorded on film. And he was recorded doing the national, an excuse me, the Yankee Doodle. It's still a song, <laughs> but the wrong song. Another younger generation person at that time that was recorded on film translated uh, Longfellow's poem about Hiawatha. We have other performers that um, actually recorded a play, a, a very short sketch, a sketch about how Thomas Gallaudet influenced Edward Gallaudet in the establishment of the, uh, of the college. And as a result, three people acted in this film, one taking on the character of Thomas Gallaudet, one taking on the character of Edward Gallaudet, and one taking on the char character of the mother, Mary Gallaudet. As a, re um, as a result, we see, uh, we see performances done by the younger generation. We also have the older generation that shared their experiences of encountering people from the first generation of signers in the United States. One person even talking about how he knew Claire, Laurent Claire and saw him. All of these were attempts to record the history 
So I've mentioned the younger generation, I've mentioned the older generation, and in, and, and in the process, we found that, yes, we have records of these films, but we did not have any, um, any recorded research done on these films. We didn't have any annotation or notation of what the signs were on the film. So that became one of our first steps to record the signs, the glosses for the signs, and then to distinguish each generation and what their signs were for the same concept and identify whether or not there were signs that were different for the same concept. <laughs> that's me. If you see the person highlighted in the lower right corner, that's me as a child. This was my first day at the School for the Deaf, along with all the other young fellows in my dorm. My parents came and took this picture of all of us gathered together. That's my cohort generation of ASL users. This was 50 years ago. So if you, you look at me and you look at the, ASL, the NAD films, I can identify based on the fact that my parents were deaf and I, picked, I learned their generation of signs, I was able to identify many of the signs in the NAD films. You have generational changes, but each generation also can remember can have a collective memory of what these signs were historically. This was part of my journey with Patty. Um, it was fabulous. She's interpreting right now, but she just loved, uh, thoroughly enjoyed recording all of the signs uh, in the films. Through this whole process of archaeology, we discovered methodology and tools for improving upon the way that we approached the films and the way that we researched them. This process helped us develop, find a breakthrough in uh, looking at the films and in analyzing materials. One of the major factors has to do with identifying which generation is being represented on film. The generation, I am a member of the sixth generation, gotta count me, of course. If you look at the, the generational differences, if you look over to the films, you'll find that the colors represent similarities in signing patterns. The fourth generation is, is, uh, is blue and represents this, that, the fact that the fourth generation caught on the NAD films, their signs look very similar to the signs that I grew up with. The distinctive color on the second and third generation show that there was a split in their, um, in their style of signing, in, their, in the characteristics of patterns of signing. <laughs> Understand at that time when the NAD films were produced in 1910, the first generation was already in their grave. Laurent Clare, he, also, he was our connected, even, even though we don't have him on film, he was first generation, but he was our connection to French Sign Language, the original French Sign Language. So that adds further generations of connection between our modern ASL and older forms of ASL that were connected to French Sign Language or LSF. <coughs> the sixth generation is marked primarily by the fact that we weren't trained with C, with manual codes for English. So it's easy to distinguish the sixth from the seventh generation. And then newer forms, we see as distinguishing the seventh from the eighth generation. In my lifetime now, we still have people alive who are members of the fifth generation who lived during the dark per period, the sixth generation, the seventh generation, and the eighth generation. Typically, you have three generations re represented. So in the films, we see these three generations, the second, third, and fourth generations represented in the NAD films. I want to show you a couple of examples from the third generation and the fourth generation to show the distinction between how they signed at, in the 1910 through 1920 period. <laughs> 
So I'll show this distinction with the sign Father. I tried to be really careful not to show you the sign for Father, but to fingerspell it so that you, I, I don't prejudice you or bias you to what you want to see. Robert McGregor is a representative of the third generation. And this is how he signs Father. This sign shows up repeatedly in one of his presentations, one of his lectures. Here's the fourth generation form by Winfield Marshall. And that also occurs repeatedly in his video rendition of Yankee Doodle. Of course, today we see versions of Father that are very similar to Marshall's. But when we look, to look at McGregor's, we, look at the, we want to look at the contemporaneous period that they both lived in. Was there diversity? Yes. There were definitely differences. And when I grew up, I saw older people using McGregor's form of father. I didn't use it, but older people in my community did. I have that held in my collective, in my own memory, whereas the younger generation growing up today may not have any memory of that particular form from McGregor. It has all but disappeared. Interestingly enough, people who have memorized um, the typical translated versions such as the Lord's Prayer, they will, use, they will revert back to McGregor's version because of its literary heritage. Patty and I were aware of this, but how do we record these signs? How do we record the differences between the generations that, were con that lived contemporaneously? We see in Sternberg, an accounting for how to make this distinction. In his description, his account for this was that the McGregor version was a formal version in 1981. And then the uh, Marshall version, he labeled an informal version or a variant of that sign. This was Sternberg's accounting of our metalinguistic knowledge or memory of how signs were produced. And he determined, based on <coughs> what his memory was, an accounting for the rationale behind the two forms. Children in school during the 1980s didn't adopt or, or didn't, may not have even seen the formal version. If they look at their own version of ASL, they may have a conversation with another individual and discuss, oh, well, yeah, and they see the, the formal version, they may say, oh, well, yeah, that, that, that's the formal version. So that they, they, they share with one another a collective memory based on their, those assumptions of that generation. If you were to look, though, at the records from the NAD um, film period, these same younger generation people may not be able to recognize or account for the, the variants that they see. People who have studied ASL histor historically in, in the 20th century and 21st century assume that signs quickly uh, <coughs> become reduced so that th they create a single form a single word. There is the assumption that sign language is very rapidly come to this particular uh, reduced form, if you will. I love watching John Hot Hotchkiss from the NAD films because he's a great representative uh, that helped, helped us to identify how this converged or reduced form was not necessarily the case historically. So I want to use his form for who or face. Patty and I actually, of course, we're documenting every sign on the films. 
So when we saw him sign this, Patty, of course, rec recorded face based on our bias today, our translation bias. However, when we, when we first began recording these signs, we also recognized conflicts and other issues uh, with other signers. We finally came to the conclusion that you had two concurrent forms at that time using the same hand shape, everything. You had face and you had the concept who. So it was homophonous at that point. You look at that sign today, it's never been reduced. It's been referred to as a metaphoric extension, um, resulting in the creation of the sign who, that then is, dis of course, <coughs> dispersed to other variant forms of ASL. And you can trace the origins from the original sign face or who back in 1910. Let's look at other uses of face or who from 1910. You can say appears like or looks like, but you, there's a variant of that that looks like this. You have look, same as, but you also see a reduced form. You never see it done expressed from the chin. It's expressed from the nose. Accounts for ease of perception or production will say that every sign will then reduce to the chin area. However, that's not what happened with resemble. What do you think is the account for that? I don't have a, any problem with accounting for it because you have to look at the context. Who had... Who has no competition with any other signs, if you will? So it can, it can actually rest uh, at the chin. However, when you look at resemble, you have look, same as. You have taste, same as. It, it tastes like this. So you have the nose and the chin competing for a location to reduce to. And as a result, you get a distinction. The nose becomes the location for the reduced form of look same as, that becomes resemble, and taste same as, then occupies the chin location. You, if you look at historical evidence, this helps to explain linguistically the, the way that signs contextually combine and then evolve. We have now a 200-year record history, recorded history, of how ASL has evolved. That helps us tremendously. Research, researchers today, however, very seldom look at this historical data. The reason they don't is because of the dark period. I, I believe the same thing. That Let me explain a little bit more about this. How these people in the 20th century <coughs> decided not to look at how educators and how deaf people 200 years ago uh, used their signs and how their signs evolved. The assumption was that the films, the NAD films, represented signed, a signed form of English primarily because they couldn't recognize many of the signs, just like many deaf people today still can't recognize a lot of signs when, they, when people use signed English. But we have to be very careful about uh, assigning these kinds of judgments and study the signed forms during their period. For example, with father, you see there are two different signs that create, or elements that create the sign for father. And I'll show you other evidence from French Sign Language that show its relationship to American Sign Language's form. <laughs> 
will look at the process also of, these, of this two segment or two element form becoming reduced to a single element form, the modern father. I noticed today that interpreters would prefer to have a single sign for a single word. They like that one-to-one -one correspondence that makes it easier for them to, to do their job. However, historically, that's not the case. We do not have simultaneous representation of concepts. We have sequential representation or non-concatenative representation of concepts that over time become reduced to a concatenative form. If we look at how words are organ word organized historically and count the number of segments or elements that represent a concept, you can then do a comparative analysis between the older version of ASL and the modern version of ASL. We created a database based on our archaeological research. We have the 1910 to 1920 films published by the NAD and three dictionaries. We also referred to the dictionaries that were contemporaneous to the production of the films. While these films were being made, there were people also producing dictionaries of lexical items and these lexical items represent, are, 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 very, are often not used today, but are very similar to what we see on the films. I've already mentioned Patty several times. Don Metley, you're here. Uh, Don was also a part of our project team. He, he has worked with me uh, in the lab for many, many years. He was our person who developed our online database, developing all of the, the, the programming, et cetera, to create the, the relationship between all of our sources. Betsy McDonald assisted with um, developing the tutorials in order for people to be able to use the database, where now it's accessible to everyone. We also had the goal on our team to expand the database by going back in history to France and incorporating early forms of French Sign Language so that we could do cross-reference um, research as well. Fanny Limousin from France uh, was the one that assisted us. She became a postdoc with us for a couple of years and she has helped us to understand better how to to archaeologically connect French Sign Language, and she herself learned more about how to, to do her own digging when she returns to France. We, she now has a good frame on which to build her study of early forms of French Sign Language. We glossed transcriptions of each sign. We also cross-referenced all the signs in all of the, re the sources that are contained in the database. We also prov have provided in this database annotations. We have English translation, uh, English uh, uh, gloss transcriptions, and annotations for all of these films and for the dictionaries. Part of our research, of course, was to understand the meta language of that period as compared to the meta-language we have today. We consulted many um, resources of that era in order to assist us. Many publications and writings by uh, people about the sign language. We are hoping that this particular foundation uh, built in our database and the tools that we provide in our book will then be able to help the people in Europe with other signed languages and in France and elsewhere in the world to have the framework to do their own research on earlier forms of their languages. <laughs>
Now you can't see it's off screen, but it, the, data, the database is contained at HSLDB, that's Historical Sign Language Database, .georgetown.edu. Once you uh, click on what you're, ch what you're looking for, then you can access um, either film titles and then watch in the entire video, the, in the entire film rep um, rendition of one of the signers from the past, or you can access the films sentence by sentence or segment by segment. There's also um, biographical information about each of the signers on the films. The, the, the middle representation in the middle row shows the, uh, the segment by se segment or sentence by sentence representation of each, of, of each text. Then over on the right center, you see the results of a search. If you type in a word such as father, it will, will produce the results for you from each of the dictionaries and from each of the films where that sign appears, okay? Once you click on one of, one of those signs from one of those signers, then it will yield results such as what you're seeing right here. But I'll let you read this description of father and how Long, back in 1910 and 1918, described production of a sign. What I have outlined is a key element of his description, of Long's description, as if lifting up a baby. That was their meta-language account for how that sign came to be. When we looked at this and compared it with French sign language, if you look at the first part of the sign, male, and look at old French sign language, you then can compare each element of that concept and see what, what French sign language did at that time or in, the, in its origins. And indeed, we have in French sign language, if you type mother on here, you will also get the same form except with the first element being female. In French sign language, one of the dictionaries published in the, in the mid-1800s described the same phenomenon, and I will show you here. This distinction between male and female, in the, in the text description, the, uh, the author was Pellissier. He published it in 1856, this dictionary. But what's important is how he described uh, these signs. He actually was a deaf professor at the school, uh, the French school in Paris, where Laurent Clair taught, and he actually was one of Clair's pupils. Once Clair left to come to the United States and, es and established the first schools for the deaf, Pellissier was much older, and he began and he published his own dictionary of French sign language which helps to record the meta-language of that era, even in France. If there are concerns about France um, being influenced by ASL, that's not the case. We see that he published earlier, and he described his description of how to produce this particular kin form was to combine either male or female, pick one, and then select one of the following kinship uh, terms. So male, fancy or fine, we have that in early ASL films as well. We find that they also have the sign for same or similar. They said combine male or female to produce Male same, female same, which led to our modern form for sister brother. The top representation, kinship representation, has to do with son or daughter. 
course, dictionaries have their limitations because they are 2D. You don't see them moving or act in action. In, able to, in, in order to identify how, what these representations really meant, we see examples in the early ASL films. So watch Edward Minor Gallaudet signing, son. Oh, before I do this, uh, I, I want to just explain that back then, at that time, when you read about what they wrote, um, or, or their meta language, if you, if you look at their meta language at that time, they actually referred to phrases. They referred to them as word phrases, not lexical phrases back then. Many people did not understand what, in, in the 20th century, did not understand what they meant by that. It's very clear today that they used lexical phrases or word phrases in order to produce concepts. The combination of two or more signs that, be, are, that represent a word, if you will. And these signs are produced in a particular sequence. Male, female first, then the kinship term second. Now, hopefully watch this film for his sign for son, if it'll work. Male, baby. Parallel to the early French Sign Language Dictionary, and when, when Edward Minor Gallaudet was born and raised by Thomas Gallaudet, he maintained the same form, since he was a second generation signer of American Sign Language, he maintained the form of the first generation that helps us to make that connection. Fanny, when she looked at the French Sign Language Dictionaries, she found that that particular form doesn't exist today in French Sign Language. The, uh, the reason why the French Sign Language, modern French Sign Language has diverged so much has to do with maintaining contact with earlier generations and the fact that when oralism took over there in France, they dismissed all of their mentors and deaf teachers and allowed only oralism. As a result, the language going underground had to be reinvented and they developed new ways of producing these concepts. Fanny didn't even realize that the earlier form of French Sign Language actually was very much like ASL until she studied this dictionary. This is me just reenacting what you just saw. We've, we're trying to establish as well a reenactment um, protocol so that if we have only images or descriptions from dictionaries, we can bring in older people who remember those forms and can reenact them, reproduce them, and add to the database. That's the reason why I wanted to show you this reenactment. That's one of our future goals. Another tool is to look at dictionaries produced at different times periods. So Watson in 64, when, and that was published when I was a child, yeah, about 14 years old, you can figure out now how old I am. Um, but my sign was probably similar to Watson's form. Older people knew the, you know, reproduced the older form, but this is the form that Watson is describing. I don't use that form today. I wonder what my form is, but the modern form, represented in Humphreys and Patton, um, Patton um, allows me to be able to reproduce all of the versions previously. Here's a reenactment of Humphreys and Patton. 
This allows us to establish a database that has a cross-reference but and, and can allow then also other people to interact with it so that we can collect further data. Older generation people, either affirming or disaffirming, they've seen that version, et cetera, et cetera. And younger people producing their versions today. So you see the relationship, the first part of the, this lexical phrase starts with male or female. And even without the picture, I can sign it now because you have a fully formed male or fully formed sign for female and then fully formed sign for baby or rock baby. What's interesting is we see that this particular word order in this phrase is consistent, very stable, and even internally in the, the single um, syllable form that we see today still has the same order of elements. It starts at the head. There's no male sign or male handshape. The handshape of the second element actually is adopted to the first part or the first element. The fir first element assimilates to the, the handshape of the second element and then if it's female, you again have the handshape of the second element influencing the first element to the point that we no longer have fully formed signs, all we have is the location. And people not distinguishing two different elements, it now is seen as a single element. <coughs> so positionally, okay, historically what was, what, you know, we know that it had a, each sign had a position in the phrase, but what is it called today now that it's reduced in form and you only have location distinguishing male versus female? We can refer to this process as a clitization process. These are now, the location is now a clitic and it always occurs in the same location. And in ASL's history, we see the same order being maintained throughout its history. It wasn't recorded this way throughout history. And people just passed on. I mean, even in Canada, people use the same ordering of elements to convey the same concept or the same word. This provides us a heritage for ASL and a French ASL heritage as well. What's fascinating is how it wasn't, it wasn't that there were many people that um, conspired or, or, or contributed to the development of the language. It was one French deaf man who came to the United States and provided an, for a foundation for the language to develop. And then the language developed naturally following that point. Metaphoric extension comes from this whole process. People then naturally can develop new signs as a result of this combination of multiple features or or elements to create lexical phrases and then evolve eventually into single unit forms. This is, this evolution um, is fascinating. And scientists are, today are not the only people that have the corner on the market, if you will. You have people historically that were scientists that studied the language in the same ways. They just use different terminology. So you have people such as Barnard, Brown, and Keith who did research and wrote about sign language. They all were graduates of Yale College. Of course, Yale College was virtually next door to, um, Hart to the Hartford School, the first school for the deaf. 
So many of the first teachers of the deaf came from that college as a result. Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet, as well, was an alumnus of Yale College. He had his connections there, and he recruited teachers and then sent them out to establish new schools. All of them were trained at the original school, and they all learned sign from Claire. He became the mentor. This was the teacher training program, if you will, of that era. That particular mentoring process was forgotten during the dark period. There were publications of how this happened, but we have lost track of those because of the dark era. These people at Yale, of course, were trained classically, and as a result, their training influenced how they taught, how they taught about language, how they looked at language of the time. And if you understand their meta language and how they looked at language at the time, then you can understand better what they, what they thought and how they described the language. One particular important concept that they talked about was word order inversion. They identified how to sign grammatically, syntactically, correctly in American Sign Language or the sign language of that time based on, on certain concepts. They went, okay, what happens in English word order or Latin word order? The sign language does it in the inverse order, if you will. This is one of their accountings for how the language was constructed. This, an example of this comes from the sign for never. I don't know if you can see that very clearly, but Edward Minor Gallaudet signed never in this way. I will show you the film, so I don't know if it'll work or not, but the sign never back then required two elements. Always, which was iterated only once, and then not or no. How do we sign it today? Okay. Never. This has this wave movement, waving movement, if you will, in it. Growing up, I didn't know that the origins of this waving movement actually had a historic history behind it. The full circle disappeared, was, was reduced, and then the sign for not back then, or no back then, was, a, was the hand being um, swept to the side. I picked up all, uh, never as being a single element form. And you don't see in the modern version any, any vestiges of the sequencing or the multi-element sequencing of the sign. Today, we don't say always no, but that two element form became reduced to a single form that is completely opaque today and non-iconic. When people look for iconicity in these signs, they're not gonna find them. You can see the iconicity if you look far enough back and think about also non-iconic elements that influence it, such as the meta-language and structure, syntactic structure of the language. But we would not have been able to find this type of evidence without establishing the database and, and looking at it in different ways. This reduced form, we looked at and thought, well, this has to do with, again, it be, the, the second part becoming a clitic, the negative becoming a clitic. It's become opaque, its meaning has become opaque in the sign for never. However, 
In other modern forms, we still see vestiges. So we still have a, a handful of signs that represent this. They're relics of that era. Again, I'm going to show you the film, uh, a filmed reenactment of each of these forms, these contrasts. Um, no versus don't know, want versus don't want, like versus don't like. In dictionaries, in the early dictionaries, you can see the vestiges and the description of how they were produced. But again, we see this two sequence, two element sequence that occurs. It can be accounted for much more clearly if we look at historical data and use historical um, explanations for it. Okay? Those three forms are still uh, I use. I did not realize they came historically from that negative sign produced afterwards. In that position of the negative sign being produced after the sign it is negating, in that order, contributed to these relics existing in our language today. However, if we want to, if we want to use don't, uh, the, a two-segment form today, we'll use not know. And many people have judged that to be English word order, which is not necessarily the case. People back then referred to it as word order inversion in the 19th, and 20, in the 19th century in particular. Once those people um, died off, the training at Yale disappeared and they had new training. New young people came, came through and became trained as, as teachers of the deaf or as people that work that work with uh, deaf people, and they didn't have the same metal language, they didn't have the same mentors, and as a result, these descriptions, this metal language died off. As a result, these younger generation people, they were bilingual and they focused on English word order and they focused on pedagogy in deaf education but they did not maintain the philosophy of using a bilingual approach to deaf education. That disappeared during the dark period. They, the, the, philosophy, the educational philosophy of the era of the films was to use the natural sign language, that's what they called ASL back then, they preserved the natural sign language, a formal version of it, on the films, and then they used that in content courses, subject matter courses, and only used word order of English in English class. They knew how to keep the two languages separate, but that heritage was, again, not preserved. Okay, so, so far, I have, uh, we have looked at and, and utilized historical linguistics research to uh, inform our work and the development of our analyses. There was a grammar historically, but the grammar today doesn't resemble the grammar of that era. M many uh, natural processes uh, conspire to create the difference or change in grammar over time. So we can, and we see this also in spoken languages. When I started studying ASL's history, I began to understand that yes, historical linguistics does help us to account for what happened in ASL. With new emerging language and the earlier forms of ASL, we see the language being formed from the discourse context. That then leads into uh, regular ways and word orders that, that are produced. That produces or creates the syntax of the language. 
They understood this historically, and historical linguistics accounts for it in this way. Morphology does not appear first. It appears much later in the history of the language. Historical linguistic um, studies were, um, were written by um, these people named up here. Now I would like to talk a little about other remnants that we use today. We have the gender affix, I refer to it as a gender affix to identify male versus female in the kinship forms. It's now a clitic. And, but we can look at other uh, paradigms, other groups of signs, of related signs, and identify whether or not these are productive or opaque or not productive. And that helps us again to understand how the language overall changes. Can I uh, continue with a few more slides? I have to look at my time. Whoops. Okay. Do you mind if I continue with a few more slides? With this understanding, we can look at and pay homage to elderly people today. What they do today helps us to understand our language better. This is uh, an Mary Green, uh, Betsy's mother. If we look at her background, she's deaf, and she went to St. Mary's School for the Deaf in Buffalo. She's a 1945 graduate, and if you ask her to sign for the sign for Sunday, we have in dictionaries these variants of Sunday, but this is the most common variant that's recorded in the dictionary. And so she was presented with these dictionary forms and asked, and asked to produce what her form was growing up. And this is what she showed. I found older videos and films that has helped me to trace the divergence of each of these forms of Sunday. Again, they come from the old films, from the NAD films. And, and we can trace them back to, we can trace them then down the generations to Mary Green's form. My lens is a modern lens, but now I have a better understanding uh, based on the research we've done and can now interpret where her form came from. So let me go back to Sunday. Think about the meta language today. We say Sunday, let's see. Um, uh, the uh, etymology behind Sunday, uh, may, one etymology may be about praying and, and raising your hands and bowing, and I thought, well, that may be an account for Sunday. However, if you look at this video rendition, I will show you there, there will be several different signers from the NAD era that will sign church, uh, Sunday. Many, many of them will sign a, it's, it's actually produced three different ways and three different combinations of forms, so just watch. I'll play them again. Hmm. Uh, Beta, it's, uh, it, I, we didn't see the full movement, but his full movement for that sign was this. That's a sign for church. Apparently the movement disappeared in this video, but um, that is related to the sign for to establish which led to the family of signs established, institution, church, etc. Vedic's was distinctive from the other three forms, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, the first person was a Gallaudet professor, established Gallaudet, and, and might be related to Hartford, the Hartford School. Edward Allen Fay, the 
The second um, signer, he learned under Claire. His father was a professor and then he became a professor in a school. He did it this way. Their accounting had to do with the crucifixion. Looking at the cross of Jesus and the crucifixion. Others represent, and then combined that with the, the rooftop of a house, which was their sign for house back then. A two, again, a lexical phrase. Vedas, however, came from Maryland, and then he went to the Colorado School for the Deaf, and uh, maybe that's why his form was so divergent. In looking at all of these forms, we see that Hubbard, this, this last signer, uh, maybe I reversed it, sorry about that. He, he did church and then the cross, if you will. Or the cross and then church. The word order was inversed. Um, the dictionaries describe that fact, that you can select these two forms and combine them and they don't have to be in the same order. It was a flexible word order at for that particular form. Church then from Vedas contributed to Mary Green's form. Let's see. And then was combined with the crucifix sign to create Sunday. At the Buffalo School, they may have seen Variants of these forms, and of course, many factors are involved. And as a, and the St. Mary's School was a, 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 a was a, a religious school, and so they may have saw, seen certain versions that they felt that um, would be more appropriate for their particular environment. As a result they made a distinction between Sunday and church and combined the two forms to create the concept of Sunday. Our form Sunday today is much more reduced. We've, we've actually eliminated the house or the church sign, allowing those signs then to develop on their own as different as having different meanings. There are other variants for the sign, but many of them can be accounted for by the original lexical phrase forms and how parts of lexical phrases then are taken and used in different dialects. So instead of using a sociological account, it's better to look at a historical linguistics accounting for many of the signs that we see in dialects today and in the practices of the schools for the deaf of that time historically. <clears throat> the way that people build words in ASL follow the same principles as people creating or using words in any language. Hopefully now you understand that this history opens up and enlightens the dark period and creates an archaeological site for us to study the language. I want to express appreciation for the research fellowships and grants that helped to fund this project as well as my co-author, Patty Clark. We felt very strongly about the fact that a book needed to be published describing these processes. And then Donald Mentley and Betsy Hicks McDonald as part of our research team helping to develop the database, et cetera. And of course, the Gallaudet University Archives. Our book is for sale here. And once you read the book, you'll be able to understand better how to use the database. What's important is that the book helps to uncover the dark period in ASL history. The dark period occurred as a result of how the meta-language sharing 
disappeared or was, was set aside and not used. People did publish historically. During the dark period, they lay dormant, they lay, they lay ignored. Looking at those, um, those documents historically help us to develop a good process, a, an effective scientific process for looking at and studying the history of ASL. It helps us to rebuild the missing links. It is discontinuous because of the dark period. In the, in the 20th century, people rediscovered ASL but did not go back and look at its heritage. And this helps to, to um, bridge that gap between the enlightenment of history and the dark and, and, and the gap that the dark period presented. Oratory historically uh, had a strong influence on these films. They, that, the oratory of that era was recorded on these films. They also, the, the films also represent stories and narratives, personal narratives, as well as performances. Of course, these films represent the elite of the signers of that time who were looked up to and revered. The reason they wanted to produce these films was to, to retain a record of these uh, master signers, if you will. However, over time, the NAD, its agenda changed. And oralism had an influence on some of this. So as a result, the people that were no longer trained with, at Yale College with the classics and mentoring, they, once they were, they were gone, the stewardship of the language and of the meta language disappeared as a result. You had other people, new people coming in with different methodologies, different meta language and different understandings and different philosophies about education using English forms of sign. You have, the, as a result, a, uh, a, a new um, PSC register, if you will, or a contact sign register. People to, it's natural in contact to have people trying to communicate and making adaptations in grammar in order to accommodate new learners of the language. For people to become a part of the deaf community to fully understand the language, they have to be a part of the language. They have to be a part of the language community. MCE systems have their history based in signed English forms, but are, are unlike signed English register of previous eras. Uh, if we have time, people can ask a few questions if you would like. Kim? Oh, I thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Hi, Ted. It's good to see you. I would like to ask you, um, the text that you mentioned, um, I'm the chairman of the American Sign Language Department, and I'm wondering, would you suggest that the, um, the book would be used in, let's say, a linguistics class, or how would you explain how it could be used within a curriculum? Uh, what kind of a unit would you think it would fit really well? Thank you. Uh, good question. You have a question as well? Let me answer Kim's question first. In looking at the book, there's, a, boom, there's extensive information. There are 12 chapters. That could, <laughs> each chapter could cover a week in a course of study. For the community, I would suggest a book club. And you could discuss a chapter per week in your book club. So I am hoping, I'm very happy to assist in in 
this next challenge of how to build a curriculum around the book. Yes, definitely. Hi. Your talk was fascinating, and I have one uh, question for you. As you looked across the years uh, from the 1800s to modern times, um, I'm curious about um, how you decided uh, how to outline the cohorts. So you have, um, I, my parents are deaf, and I'm able to remember and sign the old signs, and this doesn't have anything to do with school, so, but I wouldn't be the sixth generation. Can you, excuse me, the seventh generation. Can you explain how you established the cohorts? Ah, good scientific type of question. Yes. Uh, we investigated, um, and, and I didn't convey this information in my presentation. It is definitely easier to establish it based on years. What years were these dictionaries established? What years <coughs> did they go to school, etc.? cetera? Um, that helps to identify a particular cohort. Within a particular cohort, you will have variation. So for example, with the dictionaries, there were three dictionaries, but um, there may have been other dictionaries, but these were the ones that were recognized. Within the films, that, those, that particular time period represents three cohorts, three generational cohorts. We had representations, I mean, the, the people that were representing the fourth generation were also, also bordered the fifth generation. If you look at cohort generations, it really is akin to what we see in, in the world today. You have grandparents, parents, and children. Those, you can compare it that way. The grandparents can be understood from, for the most part by grandchildren. Once, they're, once they die out, then the, only the grandchildren and the children remember their signs, and, and it gets passed on and changed in that way. <clears throat> it's the same thing in spoken languages. Spoken, there are many spoken languages that do not have a written record of their language, a written form, and they will pass their language down in the same way from the two older generations ahead of them. The challenge is that older generation people often will adopt the signs or the words of the younger generations. That happens. We know that happens. But to elicit information from the older generation, we have to carefully show them signs from the past and say, do you remember seeing this? Or do you remember seeing older people using this? Because they don't use that form today. But that does help us to record which generation they're representative of. I know we could go all day, but one more question. OK. And we, ha we have the room until 2, so we need to allow time for the book signing. Okay. Would you like to come up? <coughs> we could move the book signing to outside, perhaps, outside the room, but, but she's already set up. Uh, oh, perhaps we can do that. Are you able to move it? OK, great. Great. Or, or or move the books uh, maybe to this side of the, the room. Okay. Hi, Ted. Hello. My question for you relates to, is a historical question as well. Why do you call Clerk and Gallaudet the first generation? Um, uh, they weren't the first native signers, so that's my question. Would the first generation um, be only native signers? They weren't. N native signers, so how is that, how do you factor that in? Yes, good question. Um, in looking at emerging sign languages today, for example, the research that's done today, we often can uh, see the relationship between the first generation and influence from outside sources. So the first generation is identified as the generation that actually uses the language 
consistently. And the first generation that learns from that group, if you will. Outside influences create a pigeonized form, but, they're, but you could still refer to some of them as the first generation as well. Unless the second generation, the, their, their children change the language, when it becomes a Creole in spoken languages, you can't refer to the, um, the, the pigeonized version of the first generation as a first generation because the Creole now is a different language. So you identify the first generation as those using the Creole. We assume, however, that at stage one, you will find variation, more extensive variation. Within the second generation, you begin to see stabilization and standardization. Okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ted. Thank you to our interpreters as well. And thank you, Patty, as well. The book sales are in the rear of the room. And good afternoon, everyone.